composers down, so we'll probably be hearing a lot of chatter between the core and the crew as well. Yeah, Do Orbit Burn is uh, always exciting because that's that's basically the final commitment yes. to Splashdown, uh, which for those of you that have just joined us recently, uh, we are targeting to Splashdown in the Gulf of Mexico uh, off the coast of Florida uh, in the uh, rough Tampa area. Our recovery vessel, uh, Shannon, is out there currently ready and waiting and excited to uh, retrieve the crew from the water. And we've heard they have great weather as well. That's yeah. a huge factor when we consider bringing a crew home. We want to make sure that the wind speeds are not too high and the waves aren't either. Yeah. Um, we want it to be a smooth ride down and an easy recovery and keeping it safe, not just for the astronauts, yeah. but also the teams recovering. Them. Absolutely. Um, as you'll see uh, coming up here in the next, as Leah said, about 45 minutes until splashdown, um, you'll see once those recovery teams move into position, you'll see how quickly they work, but you'll also see See how important it is for that weather, not only just for the crew inside the capsule, but for the crews involved in retrieving the capsule from the water. Um, it's a very dynamic process, <laughs> to say the least. I'll save I'll save some uh, suspense and excitement for when it happens. Uh, but for those that have, um, you know, not followed along with our splashdowns previously. Dragon SpaceX nominal trunk jettison. Uh, Great news there. We uh, clearly had successful claw separation, and uh, the claw again, those umbilicals that are that bring power and telemetry from the trunk and the solar cells to the Dragon capsule itself. So now Dragon is on battery power. We also heard the call to the crew that there was a successful trunk jettison uh, or trunk separation, I guess I should say. So. Um, Nice to know we are in the clear. Things are moving really smoothly tonight. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that means that telemetry is looking good. Uh, the nitrox system is primed for cabin and suit cooling. Nitro nitrox, of course, is that nitrogen-oxygen mixture that we pump through the cabin and the suits. It helps keep the astronauts nice and cool and comfortable uh, while they're the while the exterior of their vehicle you know, reaches 3,500 degrees. <laughs> we want to make sure that uh, the inside is nice and comfy for them. And they do have the option to change the temperature inside the cabin, uh, either from the Crew Dragon itself, or they can ask on the ground that the temperature be changed. However, now that they're in their suits, they're getting that cooling air from their suits instead of inside the cabin. Yeah. And nitrox, for those are not those that might not be familiar, um, that is the same stuff that we use in scuba gear. So if you've ever been scuba diving, you yourself have uh, uh, have also utilized nitrox. So uh, up next, we have the final steps that Dragon will perform prior to re-entry. The SLU, or, or also known as maneuver, uh, to deorbit burn uh, attitude and the deorbit burn itself. This is the last time that the forward Dracos, which are the four thrusters located on top of the vehicle, uh, it's the last time that they will ignite. The deorbit burn will place Dragon on a precise trajectory to uh, return to the splashdown zone off the coast of Florida. Like I said before, we're targeting uh, the Tampa area, and it will last about eight minutes once it starts. So Dragon has maneuvered to the deorbit burn attitude now. Um, meaning we are just one step closer to coming home. Everything moving smoothly for the crew and the next the next milestone is for the deorbit burn itself to start. So that should happen in about two minutes now. Everything is still on the timeline. And off the coast of Tampa, of course, we have to have somebody to pick up our astronauts after their ride. Uh, we have one of the SpaceX recovery boats with medical personnel, with, uh, of course, the recovery team, also with NASA team members on board. And they'll be awaiting the capsule. There will be a couple of fast boats that go out as soon as they see the capsule land. They'll make sure that the, the vehicle itself is safe, that it's not putting off um, any uh, dangerous gases before it's lifted onto the recovery ship. And hopefully we'll have a moment to talk to uh, one of our NASA public affairs officers on the ship as well to get a first-hand account of all of the work that's happening. That would be awesome. Now we do actually have two recovery vessels in our fleet. 
Um, the one that we're utilizing today is dedicated to Gulf Coast recovery operations. And the other one we have, logically, is dedicated to our Atlantic Coast uh, recovery operations. So because we're splashing down in the Gulf, we're utilizing um, our recovery vessel, Shannon, named after Shannon Walker. Amazing. Uh, and uh, who was the second woman to fly on a Crew Dragon mission. The first woman to fly on a crew... No, I'm sorry. I have that backwards. <laughs> Shannon was the second woman to fly on a Crew Dragon mission. Uh, Megan MacArthur was the first woman to fly on a Crew Dragon mission, and she was actually the pilot uh, for Crew 1, I believe it was. I think... Was no, it was Crew 2. Crew two. Of, yeah, Shannon. <laughs> yes. Wow. It's so difficult to keep everything straight now. Yeah, Shannon uh, was a mission specialist on the Crew 1 mission, and Megan was the pilot for the Crew 2 mission. So we, uh, you know, appreciate their um, participation in our program and uh, you know we've chosen to honor them as the first two women to fly on Crew Dragon by naming our recovery vessels after them. And we are coming up on that deorbit burn less than a minute now until the burn starts again that's going to be a less than eight minute burn it's a longer one for yep. sure and that is us committing saying that we are coming home uh, that'll help Dragon exit the uh, Earth's orbit come into the atmosphere and looks like those thrusters are firing on those screens. It looks like we uh, can see some activity there. Once again, on the left-hand side of your screen is uh, our commander, Raja Chari, and on the right-hand side is pilot Tom Marshburn. And that's a live view of SpaceX Mission Control just behind Leah and myself uh, here at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. Teams there are uh, monitoring Dragon. As we said before, it is completely autonomous, so it is flying itself. Uh, you know, the computer can do the math and the calculations much faster than a human can. So just from a, a safety factor, it's much safer. Um, but yes, yeah, so the crew are, you know, safely buckled into their seats. And uh, as this deorbit burn is underway, as Leah said, uh, this commits us to splash down uh, off the coast of Florida. And again, they're just getting to watch on those screens. Um, making sure everything is going smoothly on their journey home. So they're staying informed, even though they're not having to uh, command any of this at all. About six and a half minutes left in the burn. Again, it's about a seven, uh, seven minute, 45 second burn, I believe. Yeah, we heard uh, a quick debrief to the crew just prior to going live with our webcast. And as Leah mentioned, the weather is a key factor in determining where and when we will be able to bring the crew home. Um, in that report, we heard that the wind speeds were only about three knots and the wave height uh, was only about a half foot. So um, once we're able to get live views of the recovery uh, area, it sounds like we're going to have some lovely views, although it is dark, so <laughs> um, that we should see relatively calm seas, uh, you know, as far as the light can see anyway. And we also have the WB-57 plane out, uh, hoping to get some early images of Crew Dragon as it enters the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, but again, the deorbit burn is underway. Dragon is committed to coming home. And just a quick recap, within the last 10 minutes, we've seen a lot of action. Uh, Dragon jettisoned its trunk and initiated the deorbit burn just a few minutes ago. Uh, for these operations, NASA and SpaceX closely coordinate with the U.S. Coast Guard. They establish a safety zone to ensure public safety and the safety of those involved in the recovery operations, as well as the crew aboard the returning spacecraft, of course. But multiple notices are issued to the Mariners in advance and during recovery operations, and the Coast Guard patrol boats are also deployed to discourage boaters from entering the splashdown zones. So. We want to stress to the public the need to respect this safety zone. Recovering a spacecraft from the water is a hazardous operation, and any other boats interfering increases the risk to astronauts in the capsule, the teams working to recover them from the water, and the safety of those that come too close. So for the safety of the crew and for your safety, we recommend you sit back and watch as we are bringing you the best possible views of our astronauts' homecoming. It doesn't get better than inside the capsule. Yeah, I would have to agree. On their way home. <laughs> uh, like I mentioned, earlier, this deorbit burn is the last time uh, for those four forward Draco thrusters to fire. Uh, forward basically meaning 
top. So they're the Draco thrusters at the top of Dragon. Uh, Dragon Endurance has uh, not yet entered Earth's atmosphere. This deorbit burn is what will line the vehicle up and put it on its final trajectory to the landing site off the coast of Florida. Uh, right now, Raja, Tom, Kayla, and Matthias are using their screens to keep tabs on the burn duration. Uh, you can see right there for yourself uh, those Draco thruster firings uh, and the trajectory details like entry angle, capsule peregrine, and how much distance remaining until deorbit burn termination. Uh, like I said before, Dragon is flying itself, so all the crew has to do is stay strapped in their seats and keep tabs on things. We have about four minutes left in the burn. Dragon is committed to coming home, uh, and teams are committed to going to get them soon, so things are going smoothly. Um, again, a lot of action, not just in the last 10 minutes, but today we've had the crew wake up from their rest period. Uh, if they went to sleep, they might have been too excited about coming home to go to sleep. <laughs> um, and the crew on the International Space Station has their sleep period right now as well, so they have the opportunity to uh, be asleep, but I think they can watch our broadcast as well so they they might be staying up a little late yeah. this time <laughs> now with Raja Tom Kayla and Matthias uh, almost ready to deorbit and splash down back on planet Earth they'll be heading to one of seven targeted sites supported by SpaceX and NASA all of these sites are located off the coast of Florida either in the Gulf of Mexico or the Atlantic Ocean uh, spreading these supported sites across multiple locations helps to maximize the return opportunities for this mission and future crews lowering the chance that we'll have to wave off uh, due to that pesky bad weather. <laughs> Earlier today, NASA and SpaceX jointly selected primary and alternate splashdown locations off the coast of Tampa, which we mentioned is our prime area, and Panama City, which is the alternate, both on the coast of Florida. The selection process works with a lot of different variables, including the space station's orbital trajectory, which landing sites are available and have that uh, good weather we're looking for, as well as how much free flight capability Dragon has for the trip home, uh, and we also have to plan around the sleep schedule for the returning crew members. Yeah, of course. Uh, now, we'll start with calculating daily return options based off of the space station's current orbit and Dragon's capabilities to maneuver and line up for reentry. Uh, the time from undock to landing at the primary site can vary from less than six hours to more than 39. Getting home the quickest comes with some obvious benefits, but we always have to make sure that the crew if, um, is properly rested for dynamic operations. And obviously, um, that prevents us from scheduling 20 plus hour days for them. Uh, trajectory and ballistics experts provide the daily opportunities that would line up Dragon with the seven landing zones and split them into what we call ascending and descending opportunities. So just a reminder quickly that we are still in the deorbit burn. We have about a minute left out of that seven minute and 45 second burn. So we're coming up on the tail end of that. Um, but Dragon uses its Draco thrusters to leave the station and execute a series of altitude lowering maneuvers and to line up with the selected primary site. It can also change to different alternate sites while in free flight. So if we had bad weather move in and we needed to avoid that, it could have changed uh, even after leaving the station. So the weather is something we're constantly looking at. We made that final call to proceed about two and a half hours before the crew undocks. And for the Crew 3 return, we looked at a number of weather items. Some of these are obvious, like no rain or chance of lightning in the recovery zone. That's both for the safety of the crew inside the capsule and the crew uh, on the recovery teams on the water. So we're also looking for wind speeds less than 15 feet a second or about 10 miles per hour and relatively calm seas so we can safely execute the recovery operations. That includes Dragon SpaceX. The orbit burn complete. Performance was nominal. Nose cone closure initiated. The dirt scout is nominal burn, and we see the same thing with the nose cone closure burns. All right, good news. The orbit burn is complete. That seven minute, 45 second burn. They are committed to coming home. Uh, and that splashdown again, we're looking for in less than 30 minutes from now. They also mentioned the nose cone will be closing. Um, the four forward bulkhead thrusters that were just used for the deorbit burn. We won't use those again. Um, and so the nose cone can close and protect the hatch underneath. That's the hatch that they used once they arrived at the space station and to get to uh, to get on and off the space station. But tonight, whenever they exit the vehicle, they will exit out the uh, side hatch, which is the one they used when they entered the capsule about six months ago. 
So that's a live view uh, of that nose cone closing. Like Leah said, those four uh, Draco thrusters located at the forward end of Dragon will no longer be utilized. So we are closing the nose cone uh, to protect them as well as the forward hatch. So that's the hatch that was utilized to dock and undock with the station. That was pretty cool. I'm not sure I've seen that before. Yeah, it looked like a new view to me as well. <laughs> In the background, um, Dragon is inhibiting those forward bulkhead Draco thrusters that we just used to complete the deorbit burn, and that makes sure it's safe to latch the nose cone shut for reentry. Um, also, the vehicle has initiated the nitrox suit purge. That'll help keep Raja, Tom, Kayla, and Matias cool and comfortable during reentry. We're looking for that to come up in about 20 minutes. Uh, so again, the nose cone is closing, protecting the forward hatch, and our four astronauts are using their screens to monitor the locking of the nose cone, which is done by a set of hooks. So as you can um, uh, tell, we're getting excited. Uh, we're getting closer <laughs> and closer to uh, bringing this crew home. Uh, the nose cone, as we just saw, uh, was closing. Uh, and that is basically the final uh, very up close view there, as you can see, <laughs> of that nose cone closing. Um, so we're expecting that to complete in just about another minute from now. As we said before, uh, this is basically the uh, the protection of that uh, of the forward hatch as well as the forward Draco thrusters. Um, this is this is basically the final physical change, uh, the big physical change that Dragon will undergo prior to re-entry. So we've already jettisoned the trunk, uh, and now with the closure of the nose cone, Dragon is in its final. Uh, ex I'll say final f exterior physical state because obviously there's some like interior physical state differences as um, you know the system gets ready to to re-enter. So um, we're almost done with that nose cone closure. We should hear call out for that uh, any moment uh, from our team located there uh, in, at SpaceX Mission Control Center. And we also have the vehicle positioned properly so that the heat shield is what will face toward the atmosphere whenever it's coming in. That heat shield uh, will protect the rest of the vehicle and ablate some of that heat yeah. that's coming in. Uh, how hot did you say it gets again? 3,500 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. It's pretty warm. Very yeah. toasty. I'm a usually cold person, but uh, I don't <laughs> yeah. think I'd go that, that hot. <laughs> yeah, as you said, uh, Dragon has initiated the suit purge and the, the, um, the environment purge of that nitrox. So we are actively cooling the air around the astronauts. So they'll stay really comfortable inside Crew Dragon, even though uh, the exterior it gets up to 3,500 degrees. Uh, I do want to note that as a result of that temperature, um, it's actually, that's not true. It's not a result of that temperature. It's a result of the fact that as Dragon is re-entering the Earth's atmosphere at such a high speed, um, it actually forms a, a shock wave at the base of the heat shield and lots of science happens and basically there's ionization of the particles around the Dragon capsule and it'll get so uh, condensed and hot that it'll form plasma around the side of it. So that's why once we see Dragon after splashdown, uh, it'll look a little toasty. Um, but as a result of that plasma, we won't be able to communicate uh, with the crew. Um, that plasma basically prevents any radio frequencies to go in or out. We are unable to command Dragon to do anything. Um, but it, it's actually a really good thing because the Earth's atmosphere is acting as that initial braking system for the Dragon capsule to slow it down from that orbital velocity of uh, 17,500 miles per hour. So um, we are expecting that blackout period. Last that we heard, uh, the the teams were able to calculate that uh, to begin at the 30 minute mark and end at the 37 minute mark. Um, so depending on your time zone, you're in a different hour. Um, so for us, that will be at um, 9:30 p.m. Pacific to 9:37 p.m. Uh, Pacific. So uh, about a seven minute blackout period, totally normal. Uh, you'll hear it called out as LOS, uh, which means loss of signal. Uh, and then, you know, after that period, the teams here in Hawthorne will uh, try to establish communication with the crew. Uh, but realistically, hopefully by then, we'll have views from that WB plane that you mentioned earlier uh, with a thermal camera uh, to, you know, catch a view of Dragon as it has, is doing that reentry.
Yeah, fingers crossed. And you mentioned the uh, atmosphere doing the, the beginning of the work to slow exactly. Crew Dragon down. Um, after it re-enters the atmosphere, we'll have a series of parachutes. Yeah. The first two are drogue chutes. These help pull out the next four, which mm -hmm. are the main parachutes, and that'll continue slowing Crew Dragon down until it splashes down safely. Um, in the water off the coast of Tampa. Yeah. The, again, the SPAS boats will first approach the capsule, make sure there aren't any dangerous fumes uh, coming off of it, and then the uh, Shannon, mm -hmm. <laughs> the newest yeah. named uh, recovery boat, will make its way toward the capsule itself. They will lift the capsule up into a nest, mm -hmm. is what it's called, yeah. and this yep. best way to describe it. Uh, on the boat, they will pull it toward the um, center of the boat where there's a platform for the astronauts to be helped out of the capsule. They'll get out, they'll have some medical checks, um, just some routine checks after spending six months in space, uh, and then they will be, they will take a helicopter off of the ship all the way to shore where they will board another NASA jet back to Houston. So it's a very <laughs> fast return. Yeah. So the point being is that <laughs> when they land in the water, that's, you know, big picture, it's the last leg home, but more of the macro or smaller picture, uh, micro pack picture, the, the journey's not done. There's several more steps that they have to go through before uh, they are reunited with their families and back on solid ground. So yeah, um, we're expecting all of that, not all that, not the, we will probably end our webcast before the helicopter, before, yeah, yes. but it shows up. Um, <laughs> but in any case, yeah, there's a lot of dynamic stuff coming up. Um, we are expecting to hear call out uh, for completion of the nose cone closure. Uh, and yeah, that is the final major physical change of Dragon prior to that deorbit. I had, it felt like a once in a lifetime opportunity to be on board when crew two uh, came back into the atmosphere and seeing them come streaking through the atmosphere was Dragon SpaceX, nose cone is secured for entry. And Derek Steffi's nose cone closed. All right, so there we heard that call out from SpaceX core Sarah Gillis and forming the crew that nose cone closure is complete. Uh, so that was all basically the first half of, uh, of re-entry. Uh, as we begin the second half of entry, Dragon is now beginning to inject the cooled nitrox into the air being uh, delivered to the suits worn by Raja, Tom, Kayla, and Matthias. Again, this is what will allow the crew to remain comfortable while external temperatures reach that 35 500 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> the heat shield <laughs> is pointing forward, uh, basically leading the capsule to the landing site, which as I mentioned before, uh, we are uh, targeting off the coast of Tampa, Florida for landing today. Uh, now, speaking of the heat shield, Crew Dragon's primary heat shield is comprised of PICA 3.0, which stands for Phenolic Impregnated Carbon Ablator. First-gen PICA was first developed by NASA for studying and sampling comets within our solar system. So SpaceX partnered with NASA to develop PICA-X, which was the second-gen product used on all of the Dragon 1 commercial resupply missions that successfully resupplied the station on 20 missions. But PICA 3.0 was developed specifically for use on Dragon 2 crew and cargo with enhanced structural and thermal properties that optimized the heat shield and drove down the cost and mass. Always a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the remainder of the Crew Dragon capsule is composed primarily of a SpaceX proprietary of material. It's another class of thermal protection which is lighter weight versus PICA uh, and protects the underlying composite structure during re-entry to ensure the structural capabilities of the capsule are maintained. So while Crew Dragon will experience temperatures over 3,000 degrees during peak re-entry conditions, the characteristics of the TPS or the thermal protection systems coupled with the ECLIS, environmental cooling and life support system, in the pressurized interior will ensure that Raja, Tom, Kayla and Matias stay cool and comfortable during all phases of re-entry through splashdown. Yeah, so um, it's important stuff. It sounds like a lot of words, but basically the main job is to take the heat that is 
um, you know, being experienced by the capsule and dissipate it. <laughs> it's a protective barrier. Uh, now, after Crew Dragon Endurance has re-entered the Earth's atmosphere, a series of parachutes will deploy to slow the crew's descent. First will be the two drogue chutes, followed by the four main chutes to guide Crew Dragon to its first contact with Earth since, la since launching uh, in November of last year. Dragon will automatically deploy these parachutes when different pressure and positioning sensors on the capsule detect that they're at the right speed and altitude. The vehicle velocity at the drogue deploys approximately 350 miles per hour. So that's a lot better than that 17,500 before sure. it re-enters the atmosphere. So 3,000 feet... 350 is quite a bit slower, uh, but the drogues will deploy at about 18,000 feet. So those drogues help slow the capsule to 119 miles per hour, and that's about when the main parachutes deploy, so about 6,500 feet. And that's gonna slow the capsule down. The vehicle velocity at the water splashdown is about 16 miles per hour, so much, uh, much nicer cruise than that orbital velocity. But the highest G load the crew will experience during reentry is around three to five Gs. Uh, in my opinion, it's too many. <laughs> it does seem like a lot after uh, spending, you know, six months in almost zero. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm also the person that is happy to not ride the roller coaster and hold everybody's belongings and wait for them at the exit. Well, so. We should go to a theme park yeah. together because <laughs> I'm, I'm on the roller coaster. <laughs> happy to do so. Uh, so for those of you that um, are just joining us, we have um, separated, excuse me, we have jettisoned the trunk. We have closed the nose cone. Uh, we have uh, positioned Dragon into the right position, basically having that heat shield face forward, leave the Dragon capsule um, um, uh, for re-entry and we have completed the deorbit burn. Uh, so next up is the, uh, the uh, actual re-entry itself and the communications blackout. Yeah, we have about 15 minutes until the entry interface period. Uh, we again anticipate that loss of signal. This is something that always happens. It's a, it's a uh, side effect of that plasma buildup, um, but we know we will regain that communications once they have slowed down and exited that plasma. Um, we will see the drogue chutes deployed shortly after, which will pull out our mains. We'll see splashdown, and fingers crossed we'll have views of this from our WB-57 and potentially from uh, the recovery boat Shannon as well. Uh, once again, we are targeting a landing off the coast of Florida in the uh, the Gulf of Mexico, where uh, we have Shannon positioned around the Tampa area. Dragon SpaceX for entry briefing. It turns ready to copy entry briefing. Copy, Raja. At this time, I have no changes to timeline for you. Same anticipated blackout start and stop times as I briefed before. We are not tracking any vehicle issues at this time. And so far as weather goes, uh, we are still looking great. There is a slight increase in wind speed at seven knots from what I last reported, but we have a calm seas and we're ready to get you out of the water. How copy. Copy, no timeline changes, so still looks like blackout is 4.30 and 4.37, no vehicle issues, and then a uh, little change in the wind from 3 to 7 knots, but still calm seas, and uh, still go on to recover team. That's a good read back. So there on your screen, that was SpaceX core, uh, Sarah Gillis, just letting the crew know that everything is still looking good. No change in the calculated timeline for that loss of signal or LOS, as you hear it called. Um, you can see on your screen there, the crowd here at SpaceX headquarters is starting to grow slightly as we get closer to that splashdown. Um, it is a little late. <laughs> the second shift is, uh, is currently working right now, um, but I expect to see more people there as we get a little closer to the splashdown itself. Yeah, this is some of the most exciting stuff. <laughs> and we're coming up on some of the uh, most dynamic parts of the mission. So we're coming up on about 12 minutes until entry interface, which means we're around 14 minutes until that calm blackout, uh, and less than 30 minutes now to splashdown. So um, again, we'll be off the coast of Tampa. 
and this was determined thanks to um, careful analysis, not even just yesterday and today, but over the past yeah. week or so, uh, teams looking at the weather forecasts and determining the best opportunities for us to target to bring these astronauts home after, it's been 175 days for them on the space station, wow. um, but 177 days for them in space in total. Um, as we said before, we have seven different uh, possible locations to retrieve the crew from. Um, we down select based on the weather conditions and criteria that have to be met. So um, as Leah mentioned before, we select a, a primary and, a, an, alt and an alternative uh, site, and we are targeting uh, Tampa as that, that prime spot. Um, but having seven sites allows greater flexibility to say, um, okay, so for example, if the Atlantic coast is, you know, if there's a hurricane rolling through, as often does in, in Florida at certain <laughs> times of the year, you know, if there's a hurricane that just rolled through, um, you know, that might mess up weather and sea states on the Atlantic side, but the Gulf side might be super calm. Uh, so by having seven different spots um, around the panhandle of Florida, it does allow us to make assessments and have better availability for those return opportunities. And of course, these crew members uh, have spent all this time on the space station. Uh, they didn't just go up and come home. And so right. they left behind seven other people on the space station. Crew four arrived about a week ago. Um, and those astronauts took this past week to have a handover period with our crew three astronauts. So crew three is showing them all of the ropes on the space station, um, everything they need to know especially for our newbies that are on Crew 4. Uh, but currently on the space station, Crew 4 is Cho Lindgren, Bob Hines, Jessica Watkins, and Samantha Cristoforetti. Uh, Samantha Cristoforetti is an Italian astronaut. She is from the uh, European Space Agency. And then we also have the Soyuz crew of Roscosmos Cosmonauts. That's Sergei Korsakov, Oleg Artemyev, and Denis Matviev. Yeah, it was a little bit of a full house while Crew 3 was still up there. Oh, yes. Um, I could imagine that even with a week to do that, that those handover activities, that it was super busy, right? There is so much science um, uh, experiments that are being conducted on station. So having time to walk through your replacement, you know, all your lab notes, where, what you got to do next, how to do this, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and it... I, it's just amazing to me that they actually get it all done within a week. Yes. Um, so between, I'm sure there's, you know, traditions for new astronauts on station as well. So, um, you know, allowing the the celebration for, for new people to arrive, welcome to space, um, all those kinds of things, as well as the work part of actually doing a, a crew handover. Um, I can understand why a full week is needed because uh, it's it sounds really busy. Yeah, absolutely. And Crew Dragon is able to bring home some of those science experiments that yeah. the teams have worked on. They have polar freezers. Um, and I mentioned I got to go to the Crew 2 splashdown. Uh, on our helicopter flight back to land, we had those polar freezers in the helicopter with us. So oh, cool. it's a really quick return, not only just for the astronauts, but also for that science back to the researchers here on the ground so they can analyze the work that's been done. Um, and it was pretty amazing. I was like, yeah. oh my goodness, <laughs> this was in space a few hours ago. And this is what the astronauts from yeah. working on all this time. So um, I love that we prioritize not just their safe return, but also the safe return of this research that's been done for the betterment of yeah. us all. Uh, at this point in time, we're about 10 minutes away from the anticipated loss of signal. Um, that entry will begin um, just a minute later at, at 9.31 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, we expect to get that signal back at 9.37 p.m. Pacific, so um, just a, a, a brief period of lack of communication. As I said before, um, that's due to the re-entry of the capsule through the Earth's atmosphere. Um, the it's actually doing us a favor um, by the, the heat shield doing its its job of breaking, um, not not B R E A K, but um, B R A K. A, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, basically allowing the capsule to slow down uh, by using the Earth's atmosphere as that initial um, breaking process. It really helps us to not have to 
build bigger, heavier parachutes, which in space, everything is about weight, it's about mass. And so um, the atmosphere is doing us a favor. Uh, unfortunately, it does mean that, uh, as, as you said very well before, the side, of, the side effect is that <laughs> loss of signal, uh, because as the air is uh, basically densifying <laughs> because of the shock wave that's forming underneath the, the heat shield, uh, that plasma builds up on the side, the exterior gets to 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit. And unfortunately, we're unable to send any communications in or out of the capsule. Um, but I believe we should have views of, at least thermal views, of the capsule prior to uh, that AOS or acquisition of signal. Um, that's At least that's how it's, it's kind of happened in the past. Uh, we get to, to see them, and then we'll hear the core uh, call out to the crew uh, to reestablish that communication. And even though we won't have signal from Dragon, it's still doing its job. This is yeah. a fully autonomous vehicle. It doesn't require uh, commands from the ground at that time, and it doesn't require any commands from the astronauts at that time either, though they're still able to monitor uh, the performance of the vehicle. Yep. So it should only be, like you mentioned, about six or seven minutes that we don't have comms with them. Um, but it's, it's amazing, too. The vehicle's coming through so fast that if you're nearby, you can hear two sonic mm -hmm. booms once it enters the atmosphere. Yeah. So they're making their grand re -entry. Tree and that arrival. must have been so cool to see. <laughs> it is genuinely one of the things I will never forget. Awesome. It's amazing. That's very cool. Uh, so we are about seven minutes away from that anticipated loss of signal. Um, you mentioned before, yeah, Dragon is flying itself. It's completely autonomous. And realistically speaking, um, there shouldn't be much that Dragon has to do during that reentry. Um, anyway, because it's really that deorbit burn that puts it on that precise trajectory to the designated landing spot. So as we saw um, uh, several minutes ago at this point, you know, the four forward Draco thrusters were firing um, at, you know, very specific. It wasn't just all four of them firing all at once right. all the time. There there were some more impulse uh, type burns and um, that's really Dragon calculating for itself exactly what it needs to do and at the completion of that deorbit burn it was on that that precise trajectory. So um, yeah, we're, we're excited to, to bring the crew home. Um, we, like we said before, they're going from 17,500 miles per hour. That's their uh, rough orbital velocity. The atmosphere will slow them down to about 350 miles per hour. That's when our drogue parachutes will deploy. Uh, at that point, they'll be at about 18,000 feet above the uh, ocean surface. And then the drogue parachutes will continue to significantly slow the vehicle down. Um, at the 6,000 feet altitude, the main parachutes will deploy. Uh, we've got four of those. Those are the super iconic orange and white parachutes that everybody loves to see. Um, and what's really incredible is that the Rogue parachutes uh, do so much work during that initial phase between 18,000 feet and 6,000 feet um, that we don't if they didn't, if we didn't have the drogue parachutes, those main parachutes would have to be much, much bigger um, uh, in, ter in, in order to slow the vehicle down enough to make a soft landing. They, they're only going about 10, 15 miles per hour uh, whenever they make contact with the ocean surface. Those drogues are small but mighty. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So again, we're standing by for uh, the beginning of entry interface. That will kick off the rest of the um, deorbit procedures until we have splashdown. Um, last time we saw our crew members, they were in their suits. So that is um, a just in case procedure, essentially. That would be just in case the cabin were to pressurize. Copy, Raja. Tablets secure, restraints are down, and visors are closed. Additionally, can you confirm that your satchel is fully zipped? It is now. <laughs> Copy that. We are less than four minutes to anticipated LOS. We will talk to you on the other side at 4.37. Sounds good, we'll talk to you then. 
perfect timing with your comment, Leah. You were just saying that they're in their suits, and there we heard the call out that their visors are down. So yes. um, that basically means that their suit is then um, closed off to the interior environment of Dragon. Um, that is, uh, we require them to do that during the more dynamic events uh, while um, in Dragon. So obviously during liftoff and um, and during reentry, that would of course be uh, that was a that was a great call out by the core uh, Sarah Gillis. It sounded like they were able to see via one of the interior camera views that his satchel was not completely zippered. So I loved that little reminder. <laughs> Yeah, they, they made sure that the cabin is um, configured for re-entry. So that means everything Absolutely. is stowed. They would have done that a little while ago before they got in their seats and strapped up and, and connected their umbilicals. But uh, don't want a lot flying around in the cabin while they are re-entering. So yeah. everything is secured. That includes the tablets that they use to review procedures. Um, but they can still see the status of the vehicle via those three screens in the middle. So yeah. we are getting closer. She mentioned just a few minutes until we have communications blackout. Um, and we expect to hear from them again in about 10 minutes. Yeah. Now, you said before that they're going to experience about three to five G's during this re-entry period. Um, so if you've been on a roller coaster, you can imagine it's like that point where after you initially go up and that drop whenever you come back down, <laughs> it's that feeling that they're gonna have um, for, for a few minutes, I should say. <laughs> Yeah, and when they get back, um, of course, like we mentioned, they're going to have those uh, routine medical checks. So these are these are recovery, um, these are medical checks that we do as well with astronauts who fly on a Soyuz vehicle. Um, of course, those are not taking place on a ship. Those are in the steppes of Kazakhstan. Uh, they will set up a medical tent and evaluate the crew members and sometimes do um, scientific research when it comes to things like balance. Um, and so they'll do some of the same things here. They'll make sure the crew is feeling good before they take them, put them on the helicopter and send them back to land. Makes sense. Uh, after they splash down and are recovered from the water, we'll see them lifted onto that recovery vessel, Shannon. Uh, and once the side hatch is opened, we'll actually see the flight surgeon. Um, that person will be the first person to pop their head in and just do a, a quick verbal thumbs up with all four crew members um, as an initial gauge on how they're feeling and um, um, you know, based on previous returns and, you know, the way that this one's shaping up, you know, hoping to see four thumbs up there. Um, but for the most part, between now and then, uh, Raja, Tom, Kayla, and Matthias are, are mostly just going to be monitoring uh, where things are um, in terms of the return process and, and where they, where, where we fall in, the, in that. I just want to give another safety reminder. I know that it's nighttime and there probably aren't too many people boating too far off the coast of Florida, but they are splashing down um, off the coast of Tampa. That's our prime site today based on the weather. Uh, and we have our recovery boats out there, the SpaceX recovery ships ready to bring them home. Uh, this is something that we have coordinated with the U.S. Coast Guard. We also have their patrol boats in the area. So it's all for the safety of not just the crew who have spent six months in space, um, but also the recovery teams and also any uh, civilians or boaters that might be nearby uh, to stay away from the capsule, stay away from the area and respect the Coast Guard's um, patrol boats. That way you can watch here and we promise we will give you the best views and all the latest information. Yeah, I'm looking at range status right now. Um, there's a couple of law enforcement vessels out there, not too many casual, <laughs> so that's good news. Um, but yeah, so right now we are expecting that entry interface to begin soon. Uh, we are actually, it's now at the 30 minute mark, so we should be hearing the call out for LOS, um, loss of signal, which is expected to last until the uh, 37 minute mark. So we're now at 9.30 p.m. Pacific time, uh, expecting that blackout period to last until 9.37 p.m. Pacific time. You can see the crowd growing outside of SpaceX Mission Control here in Hawthorne. Everyone uh, watching as we get closer and closer to the main event, which will be Splashdown. And these teams here are monitoring the status of the vehicle as well. But again, they don't have to send commands right now. Uh, the vehicle knows exactly what to do. It's fully autonomous. So everyone is uh, simply monitoring this. We also have teams in Mission Control Houston in uh, at Johnson Space Center who are monitoring the mission um, as well as they are 24-7 monitoring the status of the space station itself.
And there's your look at Johnson Space Center's mission control. All of those team members monitoring uh, the systems aboard the International Space Station, not, not Crew Dragon itself, but they are still keeping tabs on the mission. And I believe we're already in that loss of signal. Uh, entry interface has begun, so we'll be expecting to hear back from the crew in a few minutes. Yeah, at this point, we are entering that communications blackout period, which lasts approximately six minutes due to plasma formation around the spacecraft. During this time, no vehicle telemetry is received by mission control or the recovery team, and no external commanding of the vehicle or voice communication is possible. But, of course, uh, Dragon is designed to fly itself during reentry. Um, the vehicle will be slowing down from an orbital velocity of approximately 17,500 miles per hour. The top temperature the Dragon will experience upon reentry is 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and yeah, as I said before, we're expecting that blackout to last for about six or seven minutes, uh, concluding at uh, 9.37 p.m. Pacific time. Right now, our crew three crew, I, I almost said crew four, it's, I'm getting confused. my <laughs> brain is still getting confused with all of the crews that we have in space right now. So the crew three crew are in their seats, their visors are down, uh, and they are continuing to monitor their uh, their, tab their their screens there to see um, you know what their trajectory is and basically what altitude they're at, um, and, and by doing so they're able to prepare for the various events so they know at roughly what time the drogue parachutes will deploy. Um, that of course is uh, you know a slight change in feeling in terms of what they're experiencing in within their seat. So being able to basically brace for that, um, important to know how high they are. We are expecting those drogues to deploy at about 18,000 feet. And we're about halfway through the entry interface period, so about three more minutes until we expect to acquire signal from Crew Dragon again. Um, those drogues will slow the vehicle down to about 119 miles, or sorry, 350 miles per hour. Um, and hopefully sometime soon as the capsule slows, we'll start to get views from the WB-57 that's in the area, um, as well as potentially from the recovery ship itself. But all of the team members are standing by. They arrived on the ship via helicopter today. Uh, and then again, the crew will be flown back to land shortly after landing, within pretty much an hour uh, after they splash down. They will be back on solid ground for the first time in six months. Yeah. And you said they go to um, a health facility after they come back, correct? Yes. And that's actually on board uh, the boat itself. Mm -hmm. So they don't have to wait for any health care. And it could just be that maybe they're, you know, feeling the effects of gravity for the first time. I would be motion sick for sure. <laughs> so uh, they're, they're just there to do those routine health checks and yeah. make sure that everyone's feeling as best as they can. Yeah. Once again, we are in that expected loss of signal period, that communications blackout period. We're expecting this to last um, another three minutes or so. Um, the crew is re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. The heat shield is helping to slow them down significantly. Uh, they're going from 17,500 miles per hour, roughly they're about, to uh, 350 miles per hour. So that heat shield is doing lots of work right now. Um, of course, when we saw the capsule, um, the Dragon Endurance docked with the space station uh, all throughout the last six months, it was, you know, this brilliant white. Um, that will not be the case the next time that we see Dragon Endurance. Uh, it will certainly come back with a little bit of charring on it from the, that thermal protection system doing its job of protecting the structural integrity of the capsule during reentry. To me, it looks a little bit like a toasted marshmallow. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, but we keep the capsule white while on orbit because that helps reflect some of that heat that's coming from the sun. Of course, there's no atmosphere to, to dissipate any of that heat. And so it's in direct sunlight yep. um, 45 minutes every day or every uh, rotation of the Earth. So yeah. uh, that helps keep the capsule cool. 
the same thing on the trunk. We, we jettisoned the trunk earlier today. That will burn up upon reentry into the atmosphere. Um, they, uh, only the capsule portion is coming home. Uh, so the vehicle is running on battery power. Everything has moved really smoothly so far, and we're just about a minute away until we expect acquisition of signal from the crew Dragon vehicle. Yeah. Now, once the crew splashes down, as we said before, the recovery vessel will move into place and retrieve them from the water. Um, a hydraulic lift will um, basically pick them up and set them into the nest or the cradle on the boat, and then that cradle. Dragon SpaceX, come check. Dragon SpaceX, comm check. Dragon has you, George has you out clear. Great to hear from you. So as you just heard, we had confirmation from Commander Raja Chari. Dragon SpaceX, expect automated chute deployment. Endurance Copy is expecting automated chute deployment for the start of GPS reacquisition. We see the same, expect deployment at standard altitude. Endurance Copy. So there's our first view of Dragon Endurance making its re entry to planet Earth. Six months in space. And this is the first time that these uh, crew members have been in Earth's atmosphere in that time. Um, as you just heard, we're standing by for drogue parachute deploy, so those two drogue chutes. The crew members will probably feel a little bit of a jolt as those deploy, um, but that's why they are strapped into their seats safely those custom fitted seats um, and after the drogues deploy it'll slow the capsule to about 350 miles per hour before we see the four main parachutes deploy and slow it down to about 15 uh, at the point it'll splash down in the ocean off the coast of tampa yeah now right now um, or it may have already happened the seats that the crew members are in um, actually automatically rotate to 26 automatically rotate 26 degrees in order to keep the crew within the acceptable g limits for entry and landing um, as i mentioned before if we didn't have these drogue shoots which um, they deploy around 18,000 feet so we're expecting to see those pop out any moment um, without those drogue shoots we would have to make Dragon SpaceX, brace for drogue window. So without these drogue chutes, uh, we'd have to make the main parachutes three times stronger and heavier. Expecting those drogues to deploy any moment. And of course, those drugs deploy automatically, but if, uh, if needed, the crew can deploy them manually. They have a hard line button in the capsule. It's beneath their uh, display where they monitor the mission. And of course, after the drogue chutes deploy, we'll see those main parachutes, which help to further decelerate the vehicle and allow it to make a soft landing there in the Gulf of Mexico. Great image of those drogues deploying. All right, looks like we have two healthy drogues there. And then George is visual on two drogues. Copy, we see the same. Descent rate nominal. And if you noticed, as those drogues were Copy, deploying, no, the drugs didn't open up to that full size you saw all the way at first. It's called reefing. Uh, they open up more slowly so that it's not as big of a jolt to the capsule and to the parachute system. And again, these will help slow the capsule to 350 miles per hour, which still seems fast, but compared to 17,500. There we can see the deployment of those main parachutes. The vehicle's velocity is about 119 miles per hour. Yeah, SpaceX Dragon, we see four shoots, and we could distinctly feel the two disc reefs. It looks like Donald Yeah, that reefing action that you just mentioned uh, 
playing out right in front of us. And Raja, we see the same. Excellent views here. Four main parachutes. These are the uh, last big physical change we'll see for Dragon as it continues its descent. Uh, it will slow the capsule down to about 15 miles per hour before splashing down. And teams are in position. They're they're uh, moving their way closer to where the Dragon will splash down. Again, we'll have some fast boats that will um, approach the capsule first, ensure it's safe for the recovery ship to approach. And within an hour of these crew members splashing down on Earth, we expect to see them uh, getting out of the meters. Copy 800. Now, for those that might not be familiar uh, with Dragon itself, over the lifespan of the Dragon program, we've had great success with um, water landing, which is what we are attempting today. Um, we've had uh, with uh, 25 su successful splashdowns, um, and there. Copy 600. Do that water landing uh, because it's simpler, uh, therefore more reliable, provides more margin against unlikely parachute issues. Um, now we did have to make how we did have to learn how to make Dragon waterproof, um, but once you do that, it's very much a rinse, review, reuse type process. And splashing down is um, not necessarily a new technique. 400 meters. Copy 400. 400 meters, so getting getting closer and closer back to planet Earth. Um, but splashing down is also how the Apollo astronauts return to Earth. Absolutely. So this capsule is um, not dissimilar to to uh, this design. Works very well, I should say. Uh, the capsule design when it comes to ablating heat as well as protecting crew members. And a very smooth ride home so far for our astronauts. 200 meters bracing. Copy. 200 and bracing. Teams are about three nautical miles away from the splashdown site, so um, it's going to take them a little bit of time to get there in terms of the large vessel, but there is a fast boat, as we call it, um, that will be able to get to the capsule very, very quickly, as we will see here in just a couple of moments. Once again. All right, as you can see there on your screen. Two three crew has splashed down in the Gulf of Mexico off the coast of Florida. So right now Dragon is on behalf of the entire SpaceX team, welcome home. Willkommen auf der Erde. It's been an absolute honor to support you on your mission, Endurance crew, and thanks for flying SpaceX. Thanks, Sarah. We're glad to be back. Thanks for letting us take uh, Endurance on a shakedown cruise. Looking forward to watching many more flights of Endurance in the future. That was a, a great ride uh, and enjoyed working with the NASA and SpaceX team. Thanks for getting us to the space station and back safely. Appreciate the words, Roger. As you can see on your screen, we have that visual confirmation and verbal confirmation for splashdown of the Dragon spacecraft. Dragon Endurance has returned home and NASA astronauts Raja, Tom, Kayla, and Matthias are back on Earth after a 23 and a half hour return journey from space. Now, as I mentioned before, the SpaceX recovery ship and team has been waiting for Dragon splashdown and they will now make their way to the splashdown location. And that splashdown came at 9.40. SpaceX Endurance feels like we're in stable one. Copy that, and we see the same. Coming in, confirm word go, then to the right, to the Ranger Badger. And you have a go for raising visors. Thanks. 
again, splashdown coming at 9.43 p.m. Pacific time. That's 12.43 a.m. on May the 6th in Eastern time where the crew has splashed down. Uh, stable one, which you just heard the core call to the crew, means that the vehicle is upright. They've received the go to raise their visors, and they're now waiting for those boats to approach and uh, help pull the capsule um, up to the recovery ship once it arrives. So the teams have been ready and waiting. They're about three nautical miles away. So it takes around 30 minutes to make their way to Raja, Tom, Kayla, and Matias inside Dragon. Now, right after splashdown, um, Dragon actually cuts its parachute lines. Um, that is help. That's to make sure that the Dragon capsule isn't pulled in the water if there is a little bit of wind, um, if the parachutes were to pick up some of that wind. So Dragon immediately cut those parachute lines. The teams will attempt to recover them uh, from the water. Um, the other thing uh, that Dragon does is it intakes a tiny bit of that um, ocean water intentionally to help stabilize uh, the capsules. So there's a couple of pumps at the bottom that basically flow a tiny bit of that ocean water into designated balloons basically um, to help stabilize the capsule that allows for the recovery team uh, to make a safer recovery and also allows the crew to bob around a little bit less while they're in the water waiting but we can see there that the seas are really fair um, as we heard um, a little while ago the the last reading that we had were half foot waves and that looks to be relatively true now Yes, I don't know if you could ask for better weather. Uh, just to look ahead at some of the things that are coming. Dragon SpaceX, come check over the boat link. Endurance has loud and clear. Copy, calm. Looking ahead, um, after the splashdown, Mission Control Hawthorne can give the go for safe, appro safe approach. Uh, and then the approach boats that we've talked about will begin inspections. They're checking for hypergalls, which are those um, noxious fumes that can come off the vehicle. Um, after those ordnance and hypergall checks are complete, um, we will see Dragon be rigged up, which means it'll be ready for pickup once the recovery ship arrives. arrives. So that usually happens again about 30 minutes after splashdown. Uh, and then they'll begin to lift Dragon onto the deck. That takes just a couple of minutes. And once they have lifted Dragon into the nest and pulled it toward the um, recovery platform, we will see the hatch open and our crew three astronauts take their first breath of fresh earth air yeah. for the first time in six months. Yeah, once that side hatch is opened, uh, that's the first time it's been opened since liftoff uh, since launch day. Of course, the crew uses the forward hatch, which is located under the nose cone at the very top of the capsule. Um, they use that forward hatch to get in and out of the space station, but it's that side hatch that is utilized for ingress and egress or to get in and out of the capsule while it's on Earth. So yeah, when that side hatch opens, it's the first time it's been open since they launched in November. Dragon SpaceX. We are go for recovery personnel to approach. You can expect personnel alongside in approximately one minute. And there's copy, you just stay personnel alongside in about a minute. All right, those fast boats have gotten the go to move toward the vehicle. Yeah, so we're now excitedly awaiting the recovery of our Dragon spacecraft with NASA astronauts Raja, Tom, Kayla, and Matias inside. Dragon has already autonomously completed several steps to safe itself following splashdown. Um, as you can see there, it is patiently waiting uh, in the water for that recovery team. Uh, now, for those of you just joining us, the mission has gone really smoothly so far. Um, Dragon su successfully uh, splashed down in the Gulf of Mexico off the coast of Tampa um, just a little bit ago. And as you just heard, we got the okay from the teams to begin the approach. Yes, yeah, so that splashdown coming at 9.43 p.m. Pacific. Uh, but approximately 23 and a half hours ago, Dragon autonomously undocked from the space station. And a good look there at those fast boats. Dragon SpaceX, request permission to come on board via display camera view only. Yep, uh, you guys are welcome on board. Copy that and work. Now the crew right now are still in their seats. This is similar to 
when you arrive on an airplane, you have landed on the tarmac, but you're not at the gate yet. You don't yep. want to take off those seatbelts just yet. Uh, so they are allowing the teams here in Hawthorne to take a look inside the vehicle as these fast boats approach. Um, but just a look back at yesterday, we saw them undock from the space station and complete a series of departure burns. They jettisoned the truck. Yeah, SpaceX Endurance, we've got tally on uh, recovery lights. And uh, only one complaint is these water bottles are super heavy. <laughs> Copy that, Raja. We'll work on it. <laughs> Raj, of course, making a gravity joke there. <laughs> yeah, for the first time in uh, six months, everything has a little more weight to it <laughs> now that they're back in 1G on Earth. Uh, but today we saw them jettison that trunk se section and perform the final burn, that deorbit burn, uh, very shortly ago to place them on the trajectory we had them toward the Gulf of Mexico. They successfully re-entered the Earth's atmosphere, uh, made it through that entry interface, which we had that loss of calm, uh, as we expected, and then regained shortly after. And then the deployment of the parachutes, which slowed the spacecraft down to a gentle splashdown. We had amazing views of that tonight. And so we're now following the final part of Raja, Tom, Kayla, and Matthias' journey as Dragon is lifted out of the water and placed on the recovery boat. Not there quite yet, but uh, <laughs> sooner than later. Yeah. Uh, as I said before, the upon detection of landing, Dragon automatically releases the main parachutes to prevent wind from pulling on the spacecraft. Dragon then autonomously safes any pyrotechnics that are still present on the vehicle and uh, may automatically perform additional minor system reconfigurations. Uh, as Leah mentioned, the astronauts remain, remain seated in, in their seats and they keep their suits on, uh, but the onboard air conditioning keeps the temperatures in check inside the spacecraft nice and cool, uh, and the communication systems on board remain powered so the crew can continue to communicate and make uh, funny jokes. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, this is a view inside the capsule. So um, you can see Raja there on the left has taken off his gloves, still has his suits on, and has been able to raise his visor. Um, this is their first time back on Earth in six months, and they're just still monitoring the area around them. We heard them say that they had sights on one of those fast boats. Uh, SpaceX has two fast boats in the recovery fleet, and they've moved quickly to the splashdown point. They are being followed tonight by Shannon, the main recovery vessel named after Shannon Walker. NASA astronaut, and that will move uh, into the position upwind of the spacecraft. So here's a good picture of those two fast boats. They both have very specific roles. The first approach is focused on immediate safety inspection of the capsule integrity and checking for any presence of those hypergolic propellant vapors, making sure it's safe for Shannon the recovery boat to approach the Dragon spacecraft. So once the capsule is cleared for full approach, the team begins rigging the capsule for water recovery by the recovery ship. Meanwhile, the second fast boat, which you can see in the background, is responsible for parachute recovery, and it also serves as a redundant boat to the first. We love having a backup for everything. Mm -hmm. And we'll also see a team member on a jet ski helping to gather up the now detached parachutes. As we said, the recovery vessel Shannon, it's making its way. It's not as fast as the fast boats. <laughs> so, um, but what the folks are doing there on the fast boat, whenever they begin, when it, whenever they do the initial approach, uh, they actually perform tests to make sure that the hypergolic propellants, uh, the vapors from those propellants are not present. Um, so the monomethyl hydrazine and the nitrogen tetroxide, uh, MMH and NTO, um, are toxic if you breathe them in. And so the crew, the first thing they do when they arrive, they are wearing um, uh, safety gear so that they are not breathing anything. Uh, and they have a device that is performing checks to see um, if any of those hypergolic vapors are present. Uh, when they get the all clear, then they're able to uh, further, you know, the recovery process. Um, it, it'll take a little over 10 minutes for the recovery crew to complete those safety checks. Once complete, the team will begin preparing Dragon to be lifted uh, into the re recovery vessel. As part of the preparation for this for this lift, one member of the recovery team will actually climb on top of the capsule so that they can attach Dragon's hoist rings and connect the lifting rings. Um, that's always really fun to see. The I, I promise you the amount of training that that individual goes through is quite extensive. Uh, wow, that's a great view. Um, not thermal this time. 
beautiful colors there <laughs> with the uh, the various lights that we have going on. You have a better view. Um, the individual that is actually on Dragon Capsule now, that's the person I was just talking about, that uh, will be attaching uh, Dragon's hoist rings and connect the lifting lines. Uh, so it'll take us less than an hour to raise Dragon to the recovery boat and remove the crew from the spacecraft. Uh, as Leah mentioned before, there's you know very standard medical checkouts. Uh, the crew will return to land within four hours by helicopter. Uh, if no additional medical assistance is needed, the crew will board a waiting NASA plane and depart for Houston. Uh, now for Matthias, uh, the European Space Agency has a plane that will take him to Europe. So he, he really has a much further journey yes. <laughs> to, to get home. Those European flights are a little bit longer. <laughs> Once and again, that's a live view inside Dragon Endurance. Dragon SpaceX, hyperbolic sleeves and unfired ordnance checks were nominal. Rigging is in progress. Approximately seven minutes until capsule lift. Stand by for a PMC with the SpaceX flight surgeon. And Dragon Captain's uh, section are complete in about 7 minutes left and stand by for uh, the incident. And that person on the outside of the capsule was uh, rigging the capsule, preparing for it to be lifted onto Shannon, the recovery ship, which is uh, getting closer and closer to picking up the vehicle. We do have a NASA public affairs officer from Johnson Space Center uh, in Houston, Texas, that's on the, via on the ship tonight as well. Dragon, the next call will be on Dragon to Ground Private with the surgeon. calling to the crew that uh, they would have a call, a private call, so we won't hear it here on the loops uh, with the flight surgeon. That's someone that they can discuss how they're feeling with um, ahead of those checks that they'll get on the boat. Uh, but as I was mentioning, we have Shaniqua Vareen of NASA from Johnson Space Center. And break, break, stand by. I believe we are not privatized. And again, they want to make sure they privatize those loops. It's like going to the doctor's office. It's not necessarily everybody's business. <laughs> so um, we have Shaniqua Vareen of NASA from Johnson Space Center on the recovery vessel tonight. Um, like I said, I got the opportunity to do this, and I, I wonder if she had the same experience as me. So um, there might be a bit of a delay. She's dialing in to speak with us from a satellite phone, being that they are uh, in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico off the coast of Tampa. So just checking in, Shaniqua, are you able to hear me? I can hear you, Leah. Hi, how are you guys today? We are fantastic, and thank you so much for uh, joining us today. No problem, Leah. Tonight has been nothing short of magical. Just a short while ago, the recovery team and I watched Crew Dragon Endurance as it entered the atmosphere. We also heard those two sonic booms as the crew prepared for their splashdown just a short minute, a uh, few minutes later. We've had beautiful weather and flat and calm seas, about 78 degrees here, and it's been just, I mean, again, magical. We had dolphins basically jumping and swimming alongside the boat before we, uh, before the crew splashed, right before the crew splashed down. Can and should As quick you and Kate mentioned preparations for the medical team. There is SpaceX medical. I was hoping you I'm could. Sorry. Go ahead, Leah. Yeah, I was hoping you could tell us more about uh, some of the preparations that have taken place uh, to get the crew to this point. Yes. So uh, preparations have been pretty much going on all day. Um, we've had two different teams come out different times, making sure the boat was prepared, as well as some medical bays for the crew, as you guys mentioned. They'll get checked out as soon as they uh, egress 
the uh, spacecraft. They also deployed weather balloons in advance to gauge whether or not the wind speeds and such were um, ready for uh, Crew Dragon to come through. So um, there's been a lot of threats here, and uh, Splashdown was very nominal. Um, and, yeah, just a beautiful sight. We saw it streak across the, the sky. Well, Shaniqua, thank you so much for joining us from the uh, from Shannon, the recovery ship out off the coast of Tampa in the Gulf of Mexico with a live view in person of Crew 3's return to Earth the first time in six months that these astronauts have been back to our home planet. It must have been so cool to be able to hear the double sonic boom from uh, re-entry and to just see it streaking through the sky. Now, being on board uh, Shannon, she was about three nautical miles away from the splashdown site, and it sounds far, but it's not. <laughs> no, and at nighttime, I know it's a little more difficult for... Uh, for Depth perception. Well, that, mm -hmm. and for the crew on the ship itself to be able to see the parachutes. I wasn't able to see them whenever they were coming down. That so you definitely get a, a special view here on the webcast <laughs> because we have those thermal cameras um, that can pick up on the vehicle even though it's dark outside. And again, we have had those fast boats approach the vehicle we're now waiting for Shannon, the recovery ship, to make its way closer to the vehicle. As we mentioned before, the um, team that is presently at the capsule, that's the, basically the fast boat team, uh, they performed the initial safety checks to make sure that the hypergolic uh, propellant fumes were not present. And uh, once we got the all clear on there, the individual that uh, is specially trained, extensively trained, I should say, um, to actually climb on top of the Dragon capsule and attach all of the harnessing and rigging necessary to hoist Dragon up onto the deck of the recovery vessel. Uh, that's all underway at the moment. And Shannon is making uh, her way closer and closer to the splashdown site. And this is a live view inside the capsule as uh, our four astronauts are awaiting their final pickup for the night. And again, they'll egress or exit that side hatch. It's uh, directly in front, if you can see from this view down toward the bottom of the screen. The last time they used this hatch was six months ago when they boarded Crew Dragon for ascent toward the International Space Station. It was a smooth ride for Dragon tonight. Uh, we saw the capsule claw separate, meaning the umbilicals were detached and Dragon was operating on battery power. And this happened before the trunk was jettisoned, that trunk that uh, has the solar cells on board. That trunk burns up upon re-entry into the atmosphere. Meanwhile, the Crew Dragon uses its heat shield to ablate some of that uh, heat, that up to 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit that it experiences upon re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere. We saw two successful drogue parachutes um, deploy, slowing the vehicle to about 350 miles per hour. And then those drogues pulling out four full main parachutes, those, as you mentioned, iconic orange and white parachutes, hard to miss. Uh, um, and those slowed the capsule about 15 miles per hour until it splashed down safely. Since then, again, we've had these uh, fast boats approaching. They have checked the capsule for hypergolic fuels to make sure it's safe for the recovery vessel to approach. And they're also collecting the parachutes uh, that were cut from the vehicle after it splashed down to keep it from being uh, pulled by any wind or wave forces. We also saw, as you mentioned, somebody very specially and highly trained rigging the capsule or preparing it to be picked up by the recovery vessel once it arrives. We also heard that the crew were going to do the initial check-in with the flight surgeon. That is, you know, just part of the standard operating procedure for post-splashdown, just uh, verbal 
call privatized with the flight surgeon. That's what's um, either underway now or wrapping up. Um, that's why we don't hear anything on the nets at the moment. Uh, after the recovery vessel gets close, the, all the attachments and the harnessing that um, we've put on top of the capsule, the, you know, that will all be attached to the recovery vessel and the hydraulic lift will uh, lift it out of the water and into the cradle or the nest, um, which we will hopefully get a view of soon once we're able to bring you uh, footage back from, from Shannon. Dragon SpaceX, for awareness, we're approximately three minutes until capsule lift. Wow, great news there. Yes, so these astronauts are even closer to their journey home. Uh, they will be lifted up upon the recovery ship, Shannon, and placed in that nest uh, before it's pulled to the egress or exit platform. And again, a, a medical personnel will check in with the crew. That'll be the first friendly face they see uh, in real life besides their other fellow astronauts for the first time in six months. Uh, they'll do a quick check to make sure everyone's feeling okay. And then uh, each crew member will be helped out. So just a moment ago, we had a very quick <laughs> glance from Shannon, our recovery vessel that is preparing. Uh, there's that view again, so we can see Dragon Endurance in the background with the fast boats. Um, one of my, well, not one of, probably my very favorite moment will be coming up momentarily. Uh, the individual that is actually there on the side of Dragon Capsule, um, they will most likely be at the top part when this thing happens, but we'll actually see them jump off and <laughs> back into the water. Um, I personally have a fear of dark water, so there is not enough money or, or, or uh, <laughs> incentive for me to jump off of anything into a dark ocean. <laughs> Uh, oh, but it's a yeah, little night swim. Yeah, <laughs> not in my brain. Um, but that individual that you see there, they're currently um, putting all of the required harnesses and rigging onto the Dragon capsule. Um, and then that will, of course, be attached to the lines that we see hanging from that hydraulic lift. Again, this is the, our, basically our, our first good view of Dragon Endurance from Shannon itself. And these few people that you see down. Um, on the ship, these are highly trained as well um, to execute this maneuver. So anyone else on the ship that has flown in today, um, including any medical personnel, any NASA personnel like we spoke with Shaniqua, they are uh, watching from a distance to allow this team to do their job in bringing the capsule up and setting it down into that nest safely. Now, Leah, as you mentioned, you were actually on the recovery vessel for the crew to splashdown and uh, recovery process. Um, when the astronauts were brought on board, so bigger picture, uh, back up a moment, you know, the astronauts have been in space for six months. Um, you know, their immune system needs to catch back up to planet Earth and the environment here. Um, were, did you find while you were on the recovery vessel that the astronauts, even after landing, you know, they went into the medical base, that they were still, you know, in a protected environment, uh, even on the recovery vessel? Oh, 100%. We were not allowed um, near them once it became time for them to egress. Actually, we moved into the galley, um, and it looks like your team member's about to take his night swim. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we, we stayed in the galley while um, the astronauts were helped out of the vehicle. They move straight into those medical personnel rooms. It's very restricted on who is um, able to be near them. Of course, everyone is masked. They've been in this somewhat pristine environment for about six months, not a lot of exposure to um, to bacteria. And so any or, sort or of- even pollens, allergies. Right, exactly. <laughs> so any sort of sickness, we want to prevent them from, um, from getting when their immune systems might be a little bit compromised after that six months in space. Yeah, now in the past, we have seen um, that person who at times, just because the capsule is so uh, brightly lit and the wetsuit is super dark. It kind of reminds me of a, a, a spider traversing back and forth across the vehicle. Um, and in the past, we've seen that individual climb up a little bit higher on the capsule. 
uh, prior to jumping off. But um, I just want to give a little perspective here. It's only because of the bright lights. You know, of course, for safety reasons, we want to have the area well lit during these operations. So the capsule looks like it is still that pristine white color. I promise you it is not. We've definitely got a floating <laughs> toasted marshmallow there uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. And there are multiple lines attached to the vehicle so that when it's lifted, it's not just dangling from one line. These help keep it stable um, and upright when for it to be placed into um, the nest. So it looks like we're getting even closer to that moment, but it's amazing how quickly it happens. And again, splashdown occurred at 9.43 p.m. Pacific time, 12.43 a.m. Eastern time. Off the coast of Tampa, Florida, a smooth ride home for our Crew Dragon um, NASA astronauts and ESA astronaut after 177 days in space. So with that view there, we can see the um, the color a little bit better. And clearly the heat shield did its job, um, seeing that it's only slightly toasted. <laughs> So this person's about to make their egress <laughs> from the capsule momentarily. <laughs> Whoop. Tally ho. There we go. Alon's Dragon SpaceX, brace for capsule lift. My heart rate went up a little bit just envisioning having to do what that person just did oh, sign me <laughs> in up. the seawater at night. Oh, man. <laughs> and here we go. Uh, Crew Dragon Endurance being lifted onto the Shannon recovery vessel. Pretty cool view there of the heat shield now that it has been lifted out of the water. You can see the water sloshing around there. That is um, actually where the parachutes deploy from. The main parachutes are located in that bay there under the side hatch. The drogue parachutes are located in the bays above the side hatch. That's a great view, as you mentioned, of the side hatch. So when they place Dragon in the nest, as they're preparing to do now, uh, they will pull it closer to an egress platform because this is significantly high off the ground, maybe 10 feet off the ground. So there's an egress platform that is level with the side hatch. Uh, that way it makes it easier for us to help the crew members um, out of the capsule. Capsule will be centered and oriented, as you can see, and then uh, Dragon will be moved to that hangar underneath the helipad on the ship. You know, that will prepare us to open the hatch. There we can see Dragon Endurance. Dragon SpaceX, welcome aboard the recovery vessel. Recovery personnel are completing the final checks. Stand by for translation to the egress platform. standing by. Great view there. We can see that Dragon Endeavor is now safely on our recovery vessel, Shannon. And this is a view from the helipad itself. So the vehicle will be pulled under this platform um, to where, like I mentioned, it'll be level with that egress platform, um, or I should say the side hatch will be level with the egress platform. But um, again, our crew is out of the water and preparing to get out of the capsule. Yeah. Now, once that hatch is open, a SpaceX medical doctor will be the first one in to check on the crew, uh, basically just to see if they're ready for egress um, and make sure everybody make sure everybody's feeling good. 
As I've mentioned before, while Dragon's top hatch is used to connect to the space station, our astronauts will egress from Dragon's side hatch, which we see there. Um, before opening the hatch, the spacecraft's cabin pressure must be equalized uh, with the outside environment. Once the hatch is opened, that will be the crew's first breath of fresh air since boarding Falcon 9 at the start of their mission back in November of last year. I can only imagine how good that will feel. <laughs> and uh, you mentioned that the pressure will need to be equalized to that outside. We try to keep the pressure on the space station and um, on Crew Dragon similar to what you would experience at sea level on Earth. It's about 14.7 pound, PSI, pounds per square inch. Um, so hopefully it wouldn't take too much uh, maneuvering or tweaking for the uh, pressure inside to match that outside. But it's important to note that Raja, Tom, Kayla, and Matias will be getting assistance from the recovery teams when exiting the capsule. This is the same process for any returning long-duration crew member as returning to gravity environment can wreak havoc with our vestibular system, Absolutely. Uh, which is responsible for maintaining our balance and motion. So safety is our number one priority with this operation, like with all operations. So you'll see uh, all four crew members being helped out of the capsule. They'll be assisted a few feet to the medical quarters aboard the boat. And if you've watched crews return on a Soyuz spacecraft, this is the same process as when astronauts are carried from the capsule to chairs that are waiting for them, and then they're carried to a waiting medical tent. Um, this is also the time period where any of the time-critical cargo can be recovered from the spacecraft, and the remainder can wait until the ship is back in port. So like I mentioned, those um, samples that are in the polar freezers, uh, those refrigerated samples, those are taken off at this time as well for a quicker transport back to the researchers on land. So once the ship and capsule return to land, the recovery team uh, can do additional inspections before loading Dragon on a flatbed truck at the SpaceX facility in Cape Canaveral for post-processing. We have a great view of Dragon there um, positioned in the nest. We're just waiting to see it translated uh, or moved back to uh, the platform where the crew will egress. Um, I, I want to mention one thing, you know, we have a great view, but we, we can't hear anything that's going on uh, with the recovery vessel. And something I never thought of um, in terms of the recovery vessel are also the smells. Uh, so I was actually out at Cape Canaveral for work um, this week, and I had the opportunity to visit the Axiom 1 capsule that just splashed down about a week and a half ago um, in our um, in Dragonland, our, our buildings where we process our Dragon capsules. And something that really surprised me, I don't know why, I, sh I should have thought of this, but um, Leah, you can probably comment on this because you were on the recovery vessel. Um, the Dragon capsule, you know, it did just re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. It does have a an odor to it. Um, there, there's I can't quite I can't I couldn't figure out how to describe it. Um, it's not quite chemically. One of my teammates um, actually said that it smelled like um, uh, charred bamboo. Okay. <laughs> and I can't say I ever smelled that, so I don't. I, I, I personally can't uh, verify. But yeah, uh, it, it's. Uh, you know, in their, their fresh air there. Uh, but in any case, yeah, it's just kind of interesting to think all the various things that are going on with this recovery vessel, um, all the operations that are going on. And one thing that we'll actually see them do prior to uh, opening the, the hatch is we'll see them do another safety check to make sure, um, speaking of smells, to make sure that those uh, hypergalls uh, still are not, um, you know, releasing any, any vapors uh, to make sure that it is safe to open up that side hatch before getting our uh, cruise, crew members out. And it looks like they are finishing hooking uh, the nest up to those lines that'll help them pull it toward the egress platform. You know, I wish I could have gotten close enough to uh, try and determine what that smell might be. I was, mm. I was hoping to when I was thinking about it while I was there, um, but um, we stayed, you know, a safe distance of away course. from the capsule. Um, and of course, being in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico, there's only a little bit of salt water. So yeah. <laughs> that was a, that was an overpowering yep. smell itself. You probably smell more fish than anything else. Maybe so. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but yes, we are getting pretty close now to seeing our astronauts exit the vehicle um, and taking their first breath of fresh air after six months in space. But again, 
you know, it's interesting that your colleague mentioned it smelled like, oh, here we go. We have movement. Super quick. It looked like the capsule was being hosed down a little bit just to get the, um, some of that salt water out of those bays. Once again, that bay at the top there is where the drogue parachutes are stored. And then the bay at the bottom underneath the side hatch is where the main parachutes were stored. So you can see that uh, it's a pretty compact space. You know, it's a, um, the parachutes go through a very thorough and well-checked packing process um, before they are actually stored in those bays. And the person in the middle helping to properly park uh, Crew Dragon exactly where they want it yep. to be for that hatch to line up perfectly with the egress platform. Just like you see on a runway with airplanes. Exactly. <laughs> Or a friend when Minus. I'm not doing a good parking job. <laughs> <laughs> you can see there uh, the windows for uh, the Dragon capsule there on either side of the side hatch. As you might notice, the teams are wearing their personal protective gear um, to make sure that if there are any vapors that they aren't breathing them, they're performing those checks now to um, make sure that those are not present. So coming up next, we'll perform those safety checks. We will open the side hatch. Uh, we'll see the crew. They'll be assisted uh, as they egress and make their way to the medical bays for their standard checkouts, their standard post-mission, post-splashdown checkouts with the SpaceX flight surgeon. Um, and then after that, they hop on a helicopter and they get to head back to land. And this view on the left, again, that's still inside Crew Dragon. Um, our, our astronauts just patiently waiting to make sure that everything is safe for them to exit, letting teams on board the recovery vessel Shannon do their job as they prepare to open that side hatch. Dragon SpaceX, stand by for side hatch opening and egress. And there's stuff you stand by for side hatch opening. All right. We can see the crew there taking off their PPE. We got the OK to open the hatch. That means the area is cleared of those hyper galls um, that were that the fast boats were uh, aiming to detect as well as they got some secondary checks once on board this vehicle as well. And again, the first person that you'll see peek their head into the capsule will be the medical um, officer making sure that everyone's feeling well. And the crew members will be assisted out one by one and escorted to those medical bays for those routine checks. We had splashdown only 40 minutes ago. So in that time, we have been able to um, lift and prepare the capsule for these astronauts to egress. Right now they're just wiping down the areas around the side hatch that might still be a little wet from splashdown. Just wanna make sure that when the side hatch is opened um, and we install the protective fittings that everything is dry uh, just to eliminate any possibility that um, you know nobody slips or anything whenever they are making their way out. There we can see the side hatch is open. Some applause from team members on board. That's their first friendly face that they've gotten to see in person. 
in six months, aside from their crewmates on the International Space Station. The white fixture that we saw um, just moments ago, they're now placing into the side hatch. This is just a protective cover to make sure that um, whenever the crew members are egressing that um, they don't bump anything around the hatch that protects not only the Dragon capsule itself, but also them. As most of you know, we do reuse our Dragon capsules, so making sure that we avoid any damage during the ingress and egress pro process is important. And again, it's been less than an hour since this crew splashed down, about 45 minutes now. Um, and once they are helped out of the vehicle, they'll move to those medical bays. And within really about an hour of them being um, helped out of the vehicle, they will be loaded onto the helicopter and brought back to land. So again, it's a very um, excellent process of getting getting back home, um, especially to have just been in space uh, a couple hours ago. I'm not sure if you're here, we're getting a bunch of feedback in the earpieces and speakers. Sounds like a thrill for me. That is a firm, Dragon. Uh, we are imminently going to be powering off the bilge pump. Stand by. Some of the things being passed out of the spacecraft now are those tablets that you could see earlier um, that, the space, that the astronauts use to monitor the procedures while they are in flight. And still checking in with the astronauts. We've got a couple of other NASA astronauts on board there. You can see them in their blue flight suits. You might notice that the touch screen looks a little different now than it did whenever the crew was on orbit. Um, the seats have actually rotated since um, you know they were on orbit. This is to allow for their bodies to be in a better ergonomic position uh, in preparation for the dynamic parts of reentry. So those seats have actuated. Uh, downward. This allows it uh, allows the crew to get in and out a little bit easier. And uh, we also give the opportunity to our photographers to get a couple of uh, images of these crew members fresh back from their space flight. Mm -hmm. For three of them, it was their first space flight. Um, and then for Tom Marshburn, who um, has a bit more experience. This was his third space flight, but while on orbit, all of these astronauts got to complete at least one spacewalk um, on the International Space Station. So up next, we should see some footrests come out. We detach the footrests again to give a little bit more space for the astronauts to make their exit. You can see that white protective fitting there, protecting uh, the, the components of the side hatch. We've got a good view of that and where that was installed now. And teams just speaking with the crew members. Uh, as I mentioned, we saw the tablets being removed. We saw some photos being taken. Um, we have also, oh, and there goes those, there go the footrests. Um, that are used on orbit, it will make it much easier for them to um, 
be helped out of the vehicle. They they can actually remove the footrest as well once they are in space. Gives them a little more room to float around. And sleep. <laughs> and sleep, that's true. Those of you that have joined us recently, the Crew 3 crew has splashed down off the coast of Tampa, Florida. Our recovery vessel, Shannon, has picked them up um, out of the water, and we can see there um, the teams are preparing to assist the crew as they exit or egress the uh, capsule. And that splashdown coming right on time at 9.43 p.m. Pacific, 12.43 a.m. Eastern Time, off the coast of Tampa, Florida, in the Gulf of Mexico. journey home is uh, not quite over for these astronauts. Even though they are back on Earth, they will be helped out of the um, Crew Dragon vehicle. They will have some routine medical checks done before they are loaded onto a helicopter. Dragon SpaceX, can you confirm that the audio is improved? Sounds like that was the voice of mission specialist Kayla Barron. We can see that the slide has been put in place. This helps the astronauts um, gently make their exit from the capsule. Once again, the Crew 3 crew has splashed down after spending a total of 177 days in space, 175 of those days on the International Space Station. And they saw quite a lot during their stay on the space station, including the arrival of eight visiting vehicles. That includes the Axiom 1 crew just a couple of weeks ago, as well as the Crew 4 crew uh, just last week. Crew today consisting of European Space Agency astronaut Matthias Marr and NASA astronauts Raja Chari, Tom Marshburn, and Kayla Barron. Chari and Barron were part of the same astronaut class, astronaut selection class, so um, they've done everything from training together all the way through their first space flight together. That's really cool. They were the turtles, right? They were the turtles, and we saw a turtle.